Alrighty, folks. Let us go ahead and get production quality full screen started. That's the last slide. We want the first slide. Production quality. All right. Listen. Uh, it's production quality. Just don't worry about it. Hey folks, um, all right, so this is going to be our third Python lecture, Python 3. Um, so this is a little bit, this is one of our new lectures, uh, and so we kind of just built it. Um, so we're, we're always, uh, I'm very excited for what we're going to be focusing today, um, and let's take a look at what that is. So first we'll do a little bit of a review on last lecture, just briefly discussing what we talked about uh, on Tuesday. Um, and then we're going to be talking about kind of two major topics, the first one being classes and the magic functions that go with them. Uh, and then the second one being modules and virtual environments and libraries and frameworks and all that. Um, it's a little bit of a, I'll say, denser lecture. There's a lot of slides to cover and so we'll have to move a little bit quickly. But don't worry too, too much about kind of the um, technical part of it because this is stuff for in the case of modules, libraries, and frameworks that you're going to be using all the time and that we're going to be covering all the time and so you'll be exposed to it a lot. And in the case of uh, classes in Magic, it's a little bit more optional whether or not you use it, but you know this is an honors class and so we want to expose you to concepts that are you know really cool and that other people may not know about and that you know you can be really passionate about. And so I think for me classes in Magic specifically is one of the those things that you know you can look at and be like oh you know this is suddenly making a lot of sense you know how all of these things are working um, and it's a really powerful tool as well but you'll see that hopefully in uh, just a little bit so um, I won't dawdle too much we'll go straight into the review so the first thing we talked about last uh, lecture was list comprehensions. And so with these list comprehensions, you can create a new list from an old list. Um, you can kind of do any arbitrary list. So, you know, you can have some output expression for each element in a list um, if and only if uh, it returns true from some predicate. Right. And so this is a really powerful tool. You know, this output expression allows you to do some, you know, kind of arbitrary transformation of the numbers. In this case, we're, we're doing n squared. And then this predicate lets you filter um, however you want. You know, you could do only if n is even or odd. It's really up to you. So these are a pretty powerful tool. Uh, we looked at enumerate, and so you can, you know, pass an iterable like a list into enumerate, and what it'll do is uh, give you a list of tuples where it's the index and then the uh, item itself. Um, this is just a little bit handy. You know, it's not the craziest thing in the world, um, but it is it is a useful tool sometimes when you're doing iteration um, in case you need the index and the item itself, and uh, it's too much work to do, um, you know, do it a different way. Um, we looked at sets, which are unordered and unindexed. Uh, they have very fast lookup times, though. So what that means is you can have, you know, one element in them. Uh, each element's unique. You can't ever have two. It's either in there or it's not in there, right? They're pretty fast. Um, that's because of this thing called hashing, but we won't get too much into that. That's more like 225 stuff. Um, tuples, again, are just immutable lists. Uh, they're just a kind of handy little tool to store things kind of quickly and easily. Um, and then dictionaries are, uh, the key ideas are that you have key value pairs and that when you're iterating, um, you're either iterating by default the keys, the values, or the items being a tuple of key comma value. Um, and so these are important things to keep in mind, specifically with dictionaries, you know, keeping in mind that key value pair keys have to be unique, values do not. Um, dictionaries are, are very useful and I imagine a lot of you will end up using them. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started on classes. So hopefully in CS 125 you've covered classes pretty recently. I believe you had two lectures on classes uh, in the past week or so, but if not, that's totally fine. We'll be building it up from the ground uh, regardless. So uh, classes are a way to organize your data and your functions. And they allow for great ways for the two to interact is really the core idea. And so, you know, when you're doing your no normal programming, you have a ton of variables flying around and you can write methods to work with those variables and call them kind of as the program flows. Classes are just a way of putting those two together in a more natural way, right? And being able to uh, have the two interact kind of more 
succinctly and in, in, in a way that looks easier and is easier to understand. Um, again, we're going to cover kind of a high level overview of classes, and then I'm going to introduce you to these things uh, on, you know, how you're going to be using them, and then specifically we'll talk about uh, magic functions and the coolness of those. Um, again, as a reminder, classes are really blueprints for objects. Uh, classes are a way of organizing the data and the functions, and objects are what we get when we instantiate a class or make an instance of a class. So for example, a class could be something like uh, an int, and then an object would be you know, the int itself. Um, with things like ints, we call those primitives because they're essentially so basic that uh, we, we don't really count them as entire classes or entire objects. But you know, really, at their heart, um, very often they are implemented as classes. So let's do a little bit of a thought experiment real quick before we get started. Let's just say you wanted to keep track of people who visited your website, and you want to keep track of their name as well as how many times they visited the website. What are some ways you could do this? What are some ways we could keep track of the name and as well as how many times someone has visited our website? So a lot of you may immediately think of the example we gave uh, last lecture with the sets. Um, the sets would be pretty valuable, yes. So you could store their names, um, but it's a little bit harder to store how many times they visited your website. Uh, so that becomes a little bit of a problem. Additionally, uh, you have the issue that if you have two people with the same name, which isn't all that uncommon, uh, the set wouldn't really work, right? <clears throat> You may think of a dictionary, and a dictionary would be a really good solution to this. However, you still run into the problem of if two people have the same name, those two things are going to collide, and um, you're not going to be able to store information for both of them. And so that's not necessarily perfect either. You can get a little bit more, uh, I'll say, interesting with it and keep them in something like a list. Uh, and you know, have kind of one of the elements be the person's name. Uh, in which case you can store, you know, multiple versions of someone's name, but maybe it's a little bit harder to distinguish between the two. Um, well, what we're going to end up discussing is how classes uh, solve this problem pretty easily. So how do we create a class? Uh, the step one is by saying class and then the name of our class. And so in our case, we're going to say class website user. And this website user can be whatever. It's convention to uh, capitalize kind of every single piece of it um, because that's what we do with classes. That's how people can kind of more easily tell classes from not classes. Um, classes can have variables inside of them. And so in this case, we have URL equals my website. Classes can also have methods. And so we have this init function, which is our constructor. And then we also have this other method here, uh, which will just increment um, how many views the person has, right? Anything in this first, uh, I'll say, layer of website user, anything at, at kind of this indentation, uh, those are all attributes of the function. And so in this case, URL is an attribute of the function, init is an attribute, or not of the function, my apologies, uh, there are attributes of the class. URL is an attribute of the class, init is an attribute of the class, and view page are attributes of the class. And so we're going to be using that terminology some, but really the only important thing that that means is that when you actually create this uh, class, you can say, you know, my object dot URL, my object dot init, or my object dot view page. So again, classes are the blueprints for objects. And so objects are what we get when we create an instance of a class. And so this down here on line 16, that's actually how we create our new object. And so we're gonna say user equals website user, and then any information. And if we look back to this init function, Oops. We can see that it does take it takes two parameters: first, self, and second, user underscore name. But we're only passing in one. Well, this is kind of one of the things with classes: is the first parameter is self, and you never really have to worry about it. So you only have to worry about the parameters following that. And in this case, we're passing uh, user underscore name into website user. What it'll do is it'll set some more attributes. It'll set self.name equal to user.name, and it'll set self.views equal to zero. 
And so when we, again, when we kind of have this format, when we call is what we say, when we call the class uh, with, you know, whatever parameters we need for the init function, this returns our new object. This is really similar, once again, to constructors in CS125, if you are familiar with those. But the big idea is that, you know, these objects are really just a way of storing attributes in a way that is uh, a little bit more handy. And specifically, you know, having this init function allows us to kind of have uh, attributes like self.name that aren't getting set the same for everything. So for URL, it's always going to be mywebsite.com. But for self.name, you know, this is going to be different for every person or for every object, we should say. For self.views, it might start the same, but, you know, these can change differently. So again, we instantiate the class by calling the class. Calling the class goes directly to the init function. The init function returns our new object uh, automatically. You don't have to manually return inside of it. Again, we access attributes of our object using object name dot attribute name. And so um, I'll stop moving my mouse so that bar goes away. We can see down here at the bottom on line 18, we have print user dot URL. And so we're accessing the URL attribute of the user object. The user object, if we look at line 16, is of the website user class. OK, and so what this will print is mywebsite.com, since if we remember to the previous slide, that's what the URL was set equal to. Um, this isn't a quiz question, but if I did user.name, uh, what would I get? While you guys are thinking of that, we'll also print uh, user.viewpage, but instead of actually uh, you know, printing itself, we'll just print the type. And what we can see is that this is actually a method. And so uh, believe it or not, methods are also classes in Python, but you don't have to worry too much about that. Uh, kind of the more important thing is that you can access these methods um, from here. And you might notice that, you know, we access this method without using the parentheses. Well, the parentheses uh, call something a little bit similar to init, uh, another magic function that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, you can do it without the parentheses, in which case you get the uh, class itself, the function class. Okay, so um, let's think big picture just for one second. So we have this new thing called a class. Classes have attributes. Attributes can be variables or methods. And to create a new class, we uh, just call the class itself uh, with any parameters needed. So this line 16 is really the key ID here. Okay, so you might have noticed in the previous slides, we have this thing called self, right? That was the first parameter to init. Um, we keep referring to it. What is self? Well, um, self refers to the object itself, and it is a way to access the internal attributes when you're in one of these functions. Self is always the first parameter in the methods, so you never have to need to worry about passing it in. And I'll, I'm going to... Exactly. Uh, well, <laughs> is it like this in JavaScript? Um, this in JavaScript is actually uh, way, way messier than self. Um, this can refer to a ton of different things in JavaScript, but when you're doing classes in JavaScript, yes, it works very similarly. Um, when you're doing kind of more general JavaScript, this can refer to many, many things on the web page, um, including the kind of general web page itself. This is very messy in JavaScript. JavaScript is um, sometimes a messy language like that. Um, in either case, self refers to the uh, object itself. And so specifically, it, it is actually the same. And so if we had some function here that took in, uh, say, another object and checked if self was equal to that object, we could pass kind of, an, this is going to sound weird, an object into itself, and uh, it is the same. And so um, I'll, I'll word that in another way since that was a little confusing. If we print that self, which is going to be uh, just a pointer to this object, uh, that is going to be the same as if we were to point print, you know, this user here. So user in this situation, really whatever we call this, is the same as self. It is literally exactly the same. Um, you will never be able to compare the two and have them not be equal unless uh, you're comparing it with a different object of the same class, in which case, of course, they're not equal. So why do we need classes? 
Um, they allow for a ton of possibilities. They allow for your code to be easier to read, easier to write, uh, easier to organize. It's it's really very important um, for a lot of cases that you have classes. You know, do you always need a class? Absolutely not. Do you ever need a class? Yeah, you'll need a class at some point. Um, and so what we want to do is kind of teach you this very valuable tool that you can use in the future. And, you know, maybe you use it in your projects. Maybe you just know about this information. In either case, you know, um, that that's kind of the point of this honors class is to inform you guys and teach you about, you know, super useful stuff like this. And so we're going to do a quick, 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 ugh, tripping on my words, a quick quiz question here. Um, so I'll create a poll. And so the question is, what is going to be printed by this? And so let's look what's happening. First, we create a set. We create a new uh, object. We're going to pass William Eustace into this object. And just as a quick reminder, uh, it's this class here that we're using. And so it's going to set self.name equal to user.name. We're going to add that to the class. Then we're going to create two more users. The first one with the name Mac Matt. And then the next one with the name William again. And both times, we're just going to check if these are in this set. So basically, the big question here is, is user equal to user 2 or is user equal to user 3? That's the big question. So, you know, um, kind of the, the steps in solving this is, do we think that any two objects of the same class are equal to each other? And do we think any two objects of the same class that might have the same attributes are equal to each other? I'll leave this for a little bit longer. Okay, um, so a lot of you, the vast majority of you put three, but this is a little bit of a trick question. Uh, four is actually the correct answer. And this is kind of one of those things about classes, is every time you create a new class, those are distinct objects. Those are not the same. And so even though they have the same attributes, in this case, you know, they both have uh, .name equals William Eustace, .views equals zero. Imagine if for this first class we did view page, right? And that views uh, counter, if we remember from here, self.views, got incremented by one. Are these th two things still really the same? Uh, probably not. Right. And so it is actually a good thing that these are different. And so both of these will return false. So four is the correct answer. And I'll close the poll. OK. And if you want a kind of a more technical explanation of this, um, each time you create one of these classes, each time you instantiate one, you're getting a pointer to that object. Uh, when you instantiate it twice, you're getting two different pointers. And so you're really comparing those pointers, and those pointers are not the same because they are fundamentally two different objects. Now, here's a question. Um, actually, yeah. So here's a question. What if we want it to behave like this? What if we do want these two things to be equal? Um, that's actually not outside of our reach. We can, we can change the behavior of the equals function in this case. Um, and that takes us directly to magic functions. You might say, you know, uh, changing the behavior of the equals function, that's magic. And I'd say, yes. S dot add user to. Yeah, we, we, don't, um, we don't really need to add user to into uh, the set. We're kind of just checking to see if user to is equal to user. Um, you know, th this print statement is really effectively the same as user to equals equals uh, user. Since there's only one thing in the set, and we know that. So um, we can use magic functions to change some core behaviors of Python's classes and objects. Uh, there's a limited amount of magic functions, just like there's a limited amount of core behaviors, and most of which are, are uh, started and ended by a double underscore. And so you might say double underscore. I remember double underscore. You know, this init function, that's a magic function. 
Um, init is a magic function, and it tells the class how to create an object. But there's a ton of magic functions, um, and we'll discuss some of them later. And so let's say instead of storing names, we're storing net IDs. Well, we know that net IDs are unique. And so if we ever do have two users with the same uh, net ID attribute, um, those should be the same, right? Even if their views are different, we know those should be the same, right? If their views are different, maybe something messed up somewhere, but we know that those two things are the same because they have the same net ID. And so in this situation, when if we were to run this, line 51, Uh, in this situation, if we were to run this, line 51 would print false, when really we want it to print true. We still want 48 to print false, um, but we want 51 to print true. So how can we make that happen? So let's break this down step by step. On line 51, we're saying print user3 in s, right? If we remember, this is a conditional statement saying, you know, is user3 in s? And we'll kind of translate this back into the uh, not Pythonic way of doing it. We'll say found equals false for each item in S. If item is equal to user three, we'll set found to true. And then at the end, we'll print found, right? Which line do we want to change the behavior of here? So, you know, we, we still need this found flag, uh, just that determines when we find it or not. We still need to iterate over all of the items in S, nothing needs to change there. But line 56, we want to change the behavior of this dot equals, right? Right now, it's comparing the pointers, and that's returning false uh, when we want it to return true. And so let's change how we have that. Well, I'm directly going to translate this dot equals to kind of the magic equivalent. And so if we look down here, these two things are completely equal. In fact, this double equals calls this dot equals function. To the compiler, these things are the same. Or really, to the compiler, both things are this, line 56 at the bottom here. And so what we want to do is change the behavior of this dot equals magic function. OK, well, um, that's pretty straightforward, actually. So we'll go into the website user. Just like we have in it, we're going to have this new uh, def underscore equals. Again, if we look here, it takes one parameter, which is the other user. Uh, it also, of course, as always, takes itself. And so all we'll say here is if the two types are the same, if they're both an instance of the website user class, and the names are the same, then return true. Otherwise, we'll return false. And this works. This is completely functional. Um, our new line 58 prints true uh, instead of false when it did before. And so we have essentially redefined the equals function, or the at least comparative equals function. Double equals, maybe, you want to call it. Nice. I mean, that's awesome. Um, this is kind of one of those things that I'm really kind of excited to teach you all about because I think magic functions in Python are like super powerful. Um, and so you might ask, what else can be magic? Well, uh, the short answer is like there's a ton. Um, the longer answer is let's talk about a few of them just to kind of get you, give you an idea on some of the things you may be able to change the behavior of if you wanted to. Um, so any arithmetic or bitwise operation. So, uh, you know, this object plus this object, this object minus this object, um, left shift this object, uh, this object to some power, uh, inverting this object with the tilde. Um, all of those are things you can change. You can change some of the class representation stuff. Uh, and what this means is when you say, like, print my class, so if I were to print user, it's going to print essentially a pointer. Uh, instead, you know, I can have it print their name and I can have it print their, you know, amount of times they viewed the page. I can have it print really whatever I want um, by changing this call to string. Uh, many data structures require hash. Um, we're not going to get into hashing, but the important thing is that, you know, this is kind of a core property that uh, you can you can adjust. Um, for example, if I tried to use uh, certain data structures with my object right now, uh, they would actually break. So, um, Statements like if my class call bool, and so maybe I only want um, my, if, if I say like if user uh, in our previous example, maybe I only want that to return true if they, the amount of views is greater than zero, right? Well, I can change the behavior of that. Um,
Oh yeah, you can magic the behavior of attributes. Uh, and so what that means is when you get attributes and set attributes, uh, so when literally when you say, you know, user.url, um, you know, what that actually returns goes through uh, an attribute, the get attribute uh, magic function. And when you say, you know, user.url equals this thing, that goes through the set attribute. Uh, magic function. Those are a little bit uh, harder to play with because um, you can break some things, but you know, um, to be able to adjust those is an incredibly powerful tool. Um, some really important ones that you can adjust is the length and iteration. And so if I tried to iterate, you know, if I tried to say for view in my user, um, you know, I'm not going to get anything. But uh, maybe I want to iterate over the amount of times they viewed or something, right? I can return uh, a, 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 a list that's just, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 if they viewed the page five times. And then maybe for length, I want to return directly, you know, how many times they viewed the page. Who knows, right? Um, you really do have the flexibility to have these be whatever you want. You can adjust the call uh, behavior, and so when you do my object, or in our case, uh, you know, user, um, I, I do want to draw a distinction here. This is not uh, my class. This is my object, right? The my class one ends up calling the uh, init function, the init magic function, which we can also change, of course. But these are really the big ones. Um, you don't have to memorize these. You're not going to be tested on them, so don't worry. Um, I do think it's very valuable for you to know some of these because, you know, if you're working with a class and you have some behavior that feels like something, but maybe it doesn't work like something, um, this is a really handy way to change it. Uh, and a really, you know, I'll say Pythonic way to change it. Also, it's just super cool to, you know, change the behavior of things like equals to change the behavior of, you know, the print statements of something. Yeah. So let's review what we talked about real quick. First, classes. Classes allow for new ways to time data and methods together. Classes have attributes, and they allow for our code to be easier to understand and write. We create a class by calling, we create an object by calling the class and giving it whatever it needs for that init function. Magic, magic functions are attributes of classes that define kind of specific uh, core behaviors. Uh, we can change them to be almost anything we want for custom behaviors. And um, again, please don't worry about memorizing them. Just Google it like everybody else. Um, there's a ton of magic functions. I went over, you know, a pretty small subset of them, as well as the fact that, like, you know, they all behave in, you know, slightly weird ways sometimes. Um, but, you know, all of that is, is made a thousand times easier if you just Google it. So um, when in doubt, Google it for magic. Wonderful. So we're doing pretty well on time here. And so I'll continue uh, directly to the next part, which is going to be on imports and modules and frameworks and all that. Um, that being said, you know, I, I really do encourage you to ask questions. Uh, introducing classes and magic functions are by no means kind of easy to pick up. Uh, I know this is tough, but I also think this is pretty interesting. And so, you know, if, if you think it's cool, ask a question, you know, either um, now if you're live or if you're recorded, you know, toss a question and lecture questions. You know, there's no reason that uh, channel only has to be for live questions. We're, we're always kind of watching it. And I remember last lecture we were talking a little bit how the syntax is, is uh, easy to confuse with Java. Um, I'll say hopefully magic functions are different enough and classes as well are, are different enough. I guess actually really classes are not that different. Um, but magic functions are pretty different where you won't get them confused. Um, classes and in, in instantiating objects, it's really just the difference between like new object versus uh, just object. So um, sorry, I guess. Uh, it's a really handy way of writing things, so all of the um, different programming languages have decided to do it almost the same way. Okay, so programmers are lazy, and if you want to be a lazy programmer too, then these next uh, couple slides are for you. Um, and the first way to be lazy, uh, and again, lazy is good right now. Um, generally, you know, I guess don't be lazy all the time, but in this situation, uh, we want to be lazy. And one of the major ways to do that is to use other people's code. And so libraries and frameworks. Um, I'm not saying plagiarize. Don't say Eustace told me to plagiarize my code. I'm saying leverage other people's code to make your other really cool stuff. 
So libraries and frameworks, let's talk about the difference. Um, a lot of people harp on this a lot. Um, I'm, I'm not too worried about the difference between the two, um, but it is an important thing to know. So libraries are really just a set of helper functions, helper objects, helper modules, whatever it may be, that you are going to use to do your own thing. Right. And so and a simple library would be like a math library that calculates the mean of a list. Right. NumPy, if any of you are familiar with that, uh, if not, we'll talk about it in a bit. That's a great example of a library. A framework defines other functions and objects that you will then uh, kind of tell it what to do with. Right. And so it's really the skeleton that it provides. And really, um, some people like to distinguish the two, saying libraries, you're controlling the code. And then frameworks, the framework is controlling the, the code, or at least the flow of the program. Um, an example of a framework is something like, you know, modern machine learning frameworks where you tell it, you know, the architecture of your model and it's going to worry about all the other stuff or at least most of the other stuff. Or maybe, um, you know, we'll talk about web development. Uh, you have package or frameworks like Flask and Django. Those are frameworks for um, kind of web hosting and web development where you'll tell it, you know, what web page you want to serve and it'll handle the rest. Again, not too worried about the difference between these two, but it is kind of handy to know. Generally speaking, I like to say Bigger things are frameworks, smaller things are libraries, but that rule does kind of break down when you get to like very advanced libraries like SciPy and NumPy and uh, Matplot. Okay, uh, so how can you start being lazy? How do you how do you use these so-called libraries, these so-called frameworks? Um, well, first uh, you need to find them, and so uh, researching is the thing. But you know, uh, researching is kind of uh, intimidating sometimes, and it just means Google it, right? Google NumPy package for I'm already lazy, yeah. Um, you know, I'll give you a great example. Um, I needed to find a package to work with kind of solar data. And so I Googled NumPy package for solar data, and I found PySolar. Uh, and that was it. <laughs> that That's the entire process. Um, so Google what you need, um, kind of match your what you're looking for with what you find. Um, if you can, get a few candidates. There's not that many um, solar data packages out there. And so uh, I was kind of stuck to PySolar. That being said, PySolar is great. Um, next, evaluate it. So look at the docs. Uh, look at look at you know the GitHub. How does it look? Is it good? If it's not, you know, if no one has updated anything in the last 20 years, you probably don't want to use it. Is the big idea here? Um, try it out. You know, make make a really simple example with it outside of kind of the main project that you're working on. Um, you know, sometimes people like to pretend like this is going to waste time, but in reality, you know, getting a core understanding of especially larger um, frameworks or larger libraries that you're going to be working with a lot is going to save you way more time uh, than you think. So, you know, uh, make a different branch and test it out, um, you know, make a simple Hello World app. You don't even really need to push the code if, if it's something really small, but get an understanding on how it works. And this is especially important with frameworks, right? Because frameworks, they're going to have their own way of writing things that you're going to have to be familiar with to use them. Um, usually, also, they're very intuitive because frameworks want you to use their code, so... Um, next, you know, start to tie it in. So, you know, you now you kind of know how it works. So start to put everything together. And um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. You're you're using it. Okay. So uh, what 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 makes a good package? So you know, when you're doing this googling and when you're evaluating it, what what is good and what is bad? Um, here's just a couple things you can look at. So GitHub stars is a pretty good indicator. Um, all of these packages are going to have GitHubs. Um, the GitHubs are going to be very easy to find. And uh, if it has a ton of stars, then, you know, a ton of people like that package. So uh, the readme on the GitHub is kind of a, a first introduction to the package. If it's well written, if they have good documentation, um, that's probably a good package. It probably has a lot of support. Um, the documentation itself. So, you know, skim through it. You're going to have to be referring to it with a lot of things. Um, if it's easy to understand, then nice. If it's not, then, you know, maybe look for one that is. Um, is there example code? I, I'm a huge, huge fan of example code. Um, you know, skimming through docs for me is sometimes a little bit like trudging through weeds. But, you know, looking at example code, I feel like I can, you know, get started with something a lot faster. Uh, 
this one is a little bit more niche, but look at the support tab. If there's, you know, 10,000 issues for a thing and, and none of them are uh, fixed, then, you know, there's probably a lot of issues with the package that, you know, you don't want to have to fix by hand. So see if there's uh, another option. And then, you know, really one of the biggest things is uh, have you used it before? Um, if you've used it before, then you should probably use it again. You're familiar with it. Um, but it's up to personal preference. I think like a great example of this is when you're doing machine learning, people have to pick between kind of the two big frameworks of TensorFlow and PyTorch. Um, have you know, just do whichever one you've used before. Who who really cares about the rest of this in in situations where you know you're familiar with it? So, um, well, if you want a good example, uh, you can look at NumPy. I I'm not going to be able to pull it up on this right now, unfortunately. But, you know, NumPy is a wonderful package. Its documentation is lengthy. It has a, probably 17 million GitHub stars. A ton of people use NumPy. Um, and, of course, it stands for Number Python um, because it's kind of the go-to package for working with data and working with numbers in Python. Okay, so you've found the package that you want. You have a plan for implementing the package that you want. How do you actually use it? How do you download it? How do you start working with it? Um, this is where we start to talk about kind of the magic keyword of import. Uh, import is the thing that you're going to be using to actually bring others pe other people's code into your code. And so what can you import? You can import modules, which is really anything with a .py extension. You can import packages, which are directories containing maybe multiple files with .py, and it also has to create this uh, init.py file. Um, don't worry too much about the complexity of having a magic function as the name for a file. Uh, it's really just standards. Um, nothing fancy happens with that other than like it, different things will look for this init.py file to uh, call it a package rather than a module as well as this init.py file really sets up the rest of the uh, files sometimes. And then built-in modules. Um, uh, Python has a lot of things built in already. It has a ton of libraries, math, random, you know, CSV, uh, IO, OS. Um, that's, you know, a, a very small subset of some of the very useful ones, but there are I actually think hundreds of built-in uh, libraries that you don't even have to worry about installing. They're already installed. Um, and so, you know, when in doubt, use one of those. It's already uh, built in. Okay, so how do we import? Um, time is another good example. Well, you simply say import. And so what you do is you say import and then the name of the module or the package. And so if you don't want to, you know, write your own math functions, there's a library for math that's built into Python. And you can just say import math. And then you can start to work with that math library into math.factorial6. And that function's going to return the factorial of 6. Another example down here is we'll import the time library. And time, you know, has a ton of very useful functions like getting the current time, the distance between two times, you know, tons and tons of stuff. Okay, um, sometimes importing the entire library, like math or time, is not great because these can be huge, right? Especially when you're working with some third party libraries. Most of the Python built in ones are, I'll say, limited in size. Um, but, you know, the third-party libraries have no reason to be limited in size, and so they can be massive. And so you really only want to import what you need. And so to import only the things you need, you can use this uh, from keyword. And so you say from module import only the stuff you're using. And so for the random function, for example, you know, there's a million different things you can do with the random function. Um, I just want this random method. And so this random method is going to just give me a number between 0 and 1. Right? And say, I'll say from random, import random. Or maybe from the math function, you only want uh, greatest common denominator and factorial. You can say from math, import greatest common denominator, comma, factorial. Um, again, this is like basically the same as saying from math, import GCD, and the new line from math, import factorial. They're the same. Okay, well, uh, factorial is kind of long. Is there a way that we can uh, shorten it some or call it something else? Absolutely. Uh, all you have to do is use, whoops, all you have to do is use the as keyword. So you can say from module, import uh, stuff you're using as whatever you want, right? And so we can say from math, import factorial as fact. 
and then we can reference factorials fact however we want. So, you know, before we said math.factorial6, now we can just say fact6. So this is how you import uh, these kind of built-in libraries. Additionally, you know, we mentioned how um, we mentioned how these can work with you know kind of anything built in or but any module that has a .py file works and so you can use other .py files in your directory and so in this situation we're in this importing .py file and if you remember before when we were talking about classes we had this classes.py file well uh, i got a little bit cut off well maybe it didn't um in line four we can say from classes import website user and so now we have access to that website user class that we wrote. I love it when my headset dies. It's a nice timer every 20 minutes. It's like, like wrap up. <laughs> um, we can import this classes or this website user class from this classes file that we had, right? And so that's super useful, um, you know, tool for kind of segmenting your code, especially once you get to kind of bigger and bigger and bigger projects, um, it can be super useful. And in fact, you can even kind of move around directories. And so one thing that I do personally is I very commonly will have like just a utils um, uh, folder or a utils file. And so I'll have utils.py and I'll say, you know, from utils import this function, this function, this function. Right. And that'll just be kind of general stuff that's related to maybe the project that I'm working on that maybe a lot of things need to use. Right. And a ton of stuff will import that in. But, you know, you can move around folders so you can say, you know, from dot dot utilities math import custom factorial as C fact. Right. And so what this is saying is from go back a directory, go into the utilities folder, um, go to the math.py file, import custom factorial, probably function or method and then rename it as cfact, right? Again, all valid stuff and useful stuff too for organizing your code. Okay, let's talk about third-party modules. Um, importing them is the same, but they are not built in, so you need this thing called a package manager to actually install them. And so package managers are used to install, to update, to uninstall, and generally do other management for third-party packages. Uh, if you wanna use code that was Yep, pip is a great example of that. If you want to use code that was written by Facebook or Google, you first need to install their code using a package manager. And if you want to update their code, the package manager uh, will be the thing to do that. The most common package managers for Python are pip and conda. Um, pip is, is pretty commonly used. You just say pip install, and then conda is, uh, is similarly used. And we'll talk about those a little bit more in a second. So virtual environments. Uh, when you want to, so um, when you install packages, they're added to your environment. And so they uh, put it in the scope of Python. And so when you say import, you know, this package, um, your environment is where Python is looking for those packages, those .py files, right? And it's common practice in kind of modern software development to have software that creates these things called virtual environments. And, you know, really, let's think about this conceptually. Don't worry about the slide for now, but just think, you know, if I'm working on two different projects and these projects are having, you need to use different packages or maybe even different versions of the same package. Um, why would I have it so that Python is looking in the same spot for both, right? It's not really efficient. It's not really a handy way of doing things. And then, you know, really worst case, if I install, you know, version 15 of this package over here and version 20 of this package over here, we really have no idea which one we're going to get when I import it. And that can cause a ton of problems because maybe I wrote my code for version 20, but it's importing version 15 and now it's running into an error and I'm spending hours troubleshooting this error. This has happened to me many times before and it might happen to you too, um, which is why you should probably use a virtual environment. So virtual environments allow you to easily separate which packages you need for different projects. And really, again, I want to uh, reiterate that all this is doing is changing where it's telling Python to look for these packages. All that it's doing is changing where Python looks for packages. Okay, so again, if you needed, you know, version 20 for one project and version 15 for a different project, you can use virtual environments to ensure that you can use them separately. Because if you tried to update to 20, or if, you know, you just installed 20, you're either not sure which one you're going to get, or, you know, previous code that you wrote for a different version may break. And then you just wasted hours troubleshooting code that you don't even know is broken yet. 
the most common package man, uh, this should say virtual environment managers, um, the most common virtual environment managers, let me just change that. For the people watching at home. Okay, the most common virtual environment managers for Python are VM and Conda. Um, personally, I use Conda, and you might notice that Conda is both a package manager as well as a virtual environment manager. Um, you can use whatever you want, but I'm going to talk about PIP and Conda uh, and not VM because, uh, yeah. Um, and so I just think that this is super cool. Let, I want to visualize for a second um, some of these packages. And so let's look at this async package, right? You, this is something you can conda install or pip install, and this is all the dependencies for the async package. So when the async people were writing their package, these are things that they installed. And then when we look at one of these, these are things that they installed. And when we go back, these are things that, you know, you see how this goes? And this can get even more complex. We'll look at a package like Cheerio, right? These are things they installed, and these installed these, and these installed these, and, you know, so on and so on and so on. And, you know, really, <laughs> this is kind of modern, uh, I'll say, code development is this huge stack of um, different, different packages relying on one another. And then, you know, we can even kind of graph all of these together. And so we'll see, you know, NPM over here, request library over here, readable stream, all importing one another and working on one another. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, this is really kind of the core core of it. Is everything, um, you know, everything uses each other. Because, you know, you don't want to write 300,000 lines of code when someone else has written 250,000 lines of code and, and you only need to write, uh, you know, 12. Okay, let's talk briefly about PIP. This is perfect timing. Um, I was worried this lecture was going to go over, but we are, we are just getting the right time. So PIP is Python's package manager to install. You say PIP install package name. And uh, if a pretty common thing that you can see is that there'll be a requirements.txt in a lot of things. that um, we expect you to probably have a requirements.txt and all that does is lists the different uh, packages that you have in the versions and so then when you install with pip uh, you know this will just install all these things kind of auto magically or at least one at a time yep uh, you generate these using pip freeze we'll talk about conda conda is a little bit newer it's both a package and virtual environment manager um, it allows you to do both things in one spot, which is pretty handy. Uh, to install packages using Conda, you do Conda install. To create virtual environments, uh, you do Conda create name and then myenv. Um, and so this is something that a lot of you may want to do uh, for CS196, is create a virtual environment for CS196. And this is how you would do it, Conda create name CS196. Um, and, you know, I suggest that you look kind of deeper into Conda's documentation for then how to use that virtual environment. It's Conda activate CS196. But, um, you know, it's, it's a pretty useful thing to do, and this will just make sure that any packages you install won't conflict with, like, things that you're coding 10 years from now. Additionally, it's a great tool to just learn Conda in general. Um, and, you know, don't be scared to come to office hours or something if you need help setting up Conda or just speak to your PM or, you know, anybody. Um, there's a ton of people that can help you setting up virtual environments and, and package managers. Uh, it's not necessarily a very uh, easy thing to know before you know it but uh you know it, it's pretty easy to pick up once you uh, start working with it and so i'm not too too worried about um, spending too much lecture time on it one thing that i will note specifically with conda and this is important if you are using conda mark down what i'm saying um, if you are in a virtual environment do not pip install and then conda install do all of your conda installs and then all of your pip installs uh, the reason for this is Conda doesn't know what PIP does. And because the environment is managed by Conda, if PIP starts to change things, and then Conda starts to change those things, and those things aren't the way that Conda thinks they are, things break uh, badly. <laughs> and you can spend hours troubleshooting and reinstalling packages. So do all of your Conda installs, and then all of your PIP installs. Um, keep that in mind. But realistically, pretty much everything can be Conda installed. Uh, one way or another. So, 
And again, when in doubt, you know, Conda and Pip and all of these have their own documentation and ways of using them. Just Google it. Just Google it. You know, I, I, I Google how to create a new Conda environment like twice a day. Uh, and it's, it's, it's very simple, right? So just Google it. Nothing wrong with that. Um, this the, these aren't specific to Python. You know, different languages use different package managers. Rust uses Cargo. JavaScript uses npm. Java uses Maven. Um, you know, they all all of these languages work pretty similarly. npm game, yeah. So we're done. We're done with Python. Uh, just on time, 10:50. Um, the next set of lectures is going to cover web development and other kind of various topics mixed in. Uh, I think we're going to be talking about kind of web dev and, and other stuff for the next four weeks or so. And so we'll talk about front end development. We'll talk about back end development. We'll talk about databases. And it's really my hope that, uh, you know, by the end of this, you guys are kind of comfortable making your own website or at least your own basic website. And so, you know, if you want to uh, take the initiative and make your own uh, GitHub repo and, you know, you can start to kind of work on some of the homeworks that are going to have you do that, um, you know, and, and yeah, um, it, it really is our hope that the, the homework and the lecture will guide you towards making your own website um, and partially in some cases require you, uh, but we'll see. Um, but yeah, that's everything. Yeah, absolutely. Google it. Absolutely. I mean, it's 2021. You know, like everyone Google stuff all the time. I think the majority of programmer programming is Googling things and learning how to do things rather than actually doing it. Do people use Flask? Because I thought Flask was kind of for noobs. Yeah, a lot of people use Flask. It is uh, harder. To, so here's what I'll say. Flask is a web um, kind of framework for websites. Um, Flask is easier to make an easy website and harder to make a more advanced website. While Django is harder to make an easier website and easier to make a harder website, if that makes sense. So like once you learn the syntax of Django, you can pretty much do whatever. But with Flask, you learn the basic syntax and it's super easy. And then it takes some more leverage to do fancier things. I use Flask personally, I should also mention. So I might be biased. Neither one is bad. You can use whatever. Okay, um, but that's all. We're like two minutes over, and so I don't want to hang up too long. Um, thank you all for coming by. Um, I'm excited that we were able to finish Python. I hope everything is going well. If you do have any questions, you know, with Python or with Lecture, feel free to reach out. Um, again, Python is a tool. We're going to be using it. It's a very useful tool to know. So I'm excited uh, that you all know it. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you, everybody, and bye-bye.